It is my desire to get through chapter 12. I haven't really read any of the stuff that I had. I just sit there and talk, and I, you know, so I want to sort of do a little more reading tonight, and some of it will be a rehearsal of a little bit that we've done. But I'd like to, if it's at all possible, to get through Genesis chapter 12, okay? <clears throat> so in Genesis 12, we noted that um, Abraham arrived in Egypt, and uh, his first thoughts was to conceive a scheme. Y'all remember that? It was to conceive a, a scheme whereby he might live and God could bring about his promises. <clears throat> All right. Just a little hint. Your schemes to keep yourself alive or to bring about God's promises are zero with no smiley face. <clears throat> okay. So, <laughs> so it's just futile. We need, we need the Lord, and, and this, this will show that. So, um, Abraham gives no hint concerning God's seed as a basis for protection and care. He doesn't refer to the seed. He doesn't refer to the son. He doesn't refer to the promise. He doesn't refer to what's in God's heart pertaining to his son. He only thinks of himself and his own schemes that's going to work to help him get by. And yes, maybe he gets by, but he gets by without the son. And he gets by without without the thing that the father's about anyway, this whole thing. The whole thing is about that. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, and in many cases, like in this case, Abr Abram, what is he doing? He is thinking about <clears throat> himself and his wife, okay? Um, and, and when we do that, we think of God's care for us, okay? And then when things get bad, that's why we doubt God's care for us because when it comes to us, we don't know if, what God feels. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe he's just mad at me right now. You know, we, we do all kinds. Of, we go off, you know, here all this stuff's happening in Egypt. And uh, he's, you know, he can go anywhere from, well, I must have sinned to, because remember, just before this, God gave all those promises, or I, you know, um, uh, you know, maybe I messed up, or maybe it's not even messed up, maybe God just is moody. Well, God's not moody, he is focused and fixed on bringing forth his son within us. <clears throat> so let me read this. So why would, well, and let me just say this before I do that. I know, I'm going to try to read. <laughs> but <clears throat> we don't think in terms of his son, okay? We think in terms of us, and we think of God being way up there. We don't think of the son being inside of us, okay? The other part is that it's not, the, the, the thing that this is calling for is not to think in terms of God inside of us, Jesus inside of us. The, the point is that he's your life. That's more than him just being in there and you're the life. Okay, so that's, that's a step we haven't got to yet because the son hadn't fully come forth in the story, but that's important because it is, you know, the first, you know, square one is that we just think God is going to protect us um, because we're special or we've got such a wonderful relationship with God that he's going to protect us. Then everything goes bad in Egypt. Step two or the next phase is that, well, I look to 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 God's love for Christ in me as if he's separate from you. It's, well, at least he, he loves Jesus in me or something, you know. But the point of him putting Jesus in us is that he might be our life, which if you were in the Cross Principles class last night, we really dug into that one. <clears throat> All right, I shall read. Why would Abram only think of self-protection? It is because of his orientation. 
He does not yet, as yet, believe that all things work together for good. Okay, so <clears throat> the scripture says all things work together for good, but it doesn't just stop there. It goes on to say to those who love God who are called according to his purpose, and then it tells what that purpose is, that we may be conformed to the image of that son, that the <clears throat> reflective image coming out of us would be the son, not us. Okay. So if that's our goal, I want Jesus, I want his life, I want his nature, I want his image, <clears throat> then God's going to work all things for his son. You get that? Mm -hmm. You'd be the recipient, but he's going to work all things for his son, okay, because you're his, what, body. All right. So... <clears throat> um, but Abram holds to the belief that only good things work toward God's end. Okay, that may, you know, that's not true. That'll never be true. But, but modern day Christianity has formed our minds to believe that if something's bad, that's the devil. And if something is good, that's God. Okay, so let's see. The cross was the devil. Uh, Daniel in the lion's den was the devil. Joseph, you know, all of the things that, that went bad ended up being the very premise from which resurrection came. Life came. So <clears throat> everything that's bad, God uses all things. He doesn't have a problem. See, He's focused. He wants his son, so he'll use good things or he'll use bad things or he'll use all things, but not to make us happy, uh, make us financially well, make us um, good Christians or any of the things that we think, but to form that son within us. That's his goal, and that's his heart. That's not just his goal. He didn't just sit in heaven and go, oh, let's make a world, and this, I've got a plan. He had a heart connection with Jesus. He knew, he knew we'd mess up because <clears throat> we're a mess, up or down. But he didn't just want us to succeed. He wanted his son. All right. Um, <clears throat> we see this at work in, in him because after God mentioned the land being his and the blessings, instead of God pouring out blessings, immediately things go in the opposite direction. He had just built an altar to God over the promises concerning the land when a famine comes to the very land that he had promised, which drives him into Egypt and out of the land. <laughs> so... You know, <clears throat> we're going, well, this is confusing. You just promised me the land, and then you allowed a famine. You know, what's a famine? Well, famine can be <clears throat> a dry spell. Anybody ever gone through a dry spell with the Lord? Anybody ever had it get worse than a dry spell <laughs> and become a famine? <laughs> well, God can still use that, but he doesn't want to leave you there. He wants to bring you in, but the promises are all related to the son. And so the more we line up with his heart, the more his son comes forth, the more that, um, that we're all pleased. <clears throat> um, what is... What is he to think when God's promise, when God promised the land, but immediately allowed famine to come and allowed him to be exiled from the land? Remember, it was a famine that drove the prodigal son to the hog pen while he was in exile also. <clears throat> well, we went through that not too long ago. We went through the, the reality of the famine, and we went through the reality of the hog pen, and we went through all of that to show that the prodigal son, just like us, what, what makes us a prodigal son? You know, what makes us a prodigal son is we're not the son. <laughs> we're just not the one, okay? <clears throat> and, and again, I personally believe that the prodigal son it, it originally intended to just show the father that he could take what was the father's and use it and be a blessing 
and found out that he has other things at work in him and also other uh, externals that are working against him. The famine, just like Abraham. The famine, just like Israel. But they're not working against him. They're bringing him to a place where he is ready to say, I am not worthy to be called thy son anymore. Make me one of thy servants. And the father explodes with acknowledging the son in him. And everything changes. Everything changes. <clears throat> so, uh, while down in Egypt, Pharaoh desires to have Abraham's wife. Remember, we talked about that. We talked about she's 77 years old or something like that. And she was apparently a babe. Because the king has uh, got his eye on her. <clears throat> so, while down in, e in Egypt, Pharaoh desires to have Abraham's wife, along with the possibility of him losing his own life over it, and that's in... Uh, verses 10 through 13. Let me just read it. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, talking about Sarah, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me. But they will save thee alive. <clears throat> so he's worried about his life. He's worried about losing his life. Do you, anybody remember some of the promises that was said before this? says, you know, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. <clears throat> and now it looks just the opposite of that. So Pharaoh takes her into his harem. The end result is that the father of many nations has no wife. <laughs> Remember, God said you will be father. <laughs> there are many nations. No, he doesn't. He, she's not only barren, he doesn't have one. <clears throat> now, this is going south real quick. Okay, so, and the one who was made firstborn in heir of the land, talking about Abraham in this case, is driven from it because God allowed a famine immediately to follow his promises. Also, the one to whom God swore an oath, Abraham, that he would curse his enemies as having to devise ways to save his own life. Now, <clears throat> is he really having to devise ways to save his own life? No. But that was his fear. I mean, that was his fear before he even got there. He's going, okay, we've got to have a scheme. We've got to have something that's going to work. Well, it really didn't work. <clears throat> and ultimately, it never works because if it did succeed, it might get us further from the heart of the Lord than... If we fail, could that be the case? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> if we do not know the ways of God, we will live in confusion and bitterness simply because we think it strange concerning the fiery trial. Remember, Peter said that, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to test you. But we think it, we, we don't see it as a, I mean, we see it as a trial or a, you know, affliction, but we don't see it as God working within that to draw certain things out of us and to deal with certain other things that are in us. And that's, that's not bad, folks. That's a father. That's a good father. That's a good father. <clears throat> All right. So I'm actually getting to read some here. Is that, this is fun. But in the midst of all that that confusion, suddenly things change. Instead of God intervening with a great miracle, which is what we're usually looking for, we're looking for the great miracle. God, you got to do this. You got to help me. This is bad, you know. And I, you know, and so I, you know, I promise that I'll be good from now on, and I will, I will do all these things that you wanted me to do, but I refused to do when everything was good. But now, if you'll just fix this situation, you know, I'll be with you. So God decides to intervene, but he doesn't use a miracle. In fact, he uses one of the furthest things from a miracle. Um, <clears throat> he uses something weak. The scriptures call it a weaker vessel. It was a woman. It was his wife, Sarah. <laughs> the one who's barren. The one, he's using the one who's barren. He's using the one who has no strength, the one who is 
worried because every time God speaks to Abraham, he speaks about a seed, and she's barren, and she's freaking out because, well, when am I going to bring this thing forth, or how, what, you know, what are you going to do to, to fix this? <clears throat> the wife that was of no use to fulfill the promises becomes the reason for favor and riches from Pharaoh. <laughs> See, that's our God. He uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Because we're, we're so smart, you know, or so spiritual. Um, verse 16 says this, and he entreated Abram well for her sake. Praise God, huh? You know? <clears throat> And he, and he, talking about Abram, and he had sheep and oxen, and he had asses and men servants and maid servants and, and she asses and camels. So she was a blessing, not a curse. See, what we call cursed, God may call blessed. What we call blessed, God may say it's cursed because it's not his son. The Lord knows all the way up to this point, he knows that Sarah is going to be the one who will bring forth the son. Abraham can't do it by himself. He knows that. God knows what he's going to do. You know? But this doesn't say that God turned the king's heart toward her. I guess he was smitten. <laughs> he seemed to be, you know. But anyway... <clears throat> You know, in her mind, all she wants to do is be with her husband and bring forth a seed. Mm -hmm. But as long as she can be a blessing on this level, that's still a blessing to him. Because he's sitting there over there going, they're going to take my wife, my wife and my life. Take my wife, don't take my life. <laughs> <laughs> She's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> so the weak... The weak despise things are confounding to the strong. Uh, well, remember the prodigal son. He was weak in the sense of his constitution to be able to bring forth the son in the early part. And he was despised. He was weak and he was despised by his elder brother. <clears throat> and uh, came home empty and feeling like a failure and the father looked at him as the son of the father's love which is what Jesus is called in Colossians the son of his love the son of the father's love the prodigal didn't earn that y'all know that don't you he didn't earn it he didn't even know what he was walking into when he got there. But the, it was the appointed time of the father to bring forth the son. And that's uh, Galatians chapter 4 starts describing that process within us. And because you are sons, meaning in the family, God sends forth the spirit of his son into your heart crying, Abba, Father, that's not you. And that's not earned or deserved or whatever. But the father knows, and he, he does that. And he's, he's uh, you know, be, don't be confused about the fiery trial, which is to test you. He's, he is weighing the spirits. He's weighing everyone's heart and their spirit. It says that in Proverbs 16. <clears throat> but the Lord weighs the spirit. So, um, verse 17, uh, we'll read that in a little further. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh. Does that sound familiar to anyone? And his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. <laughs> which apparently he didn't up to that point. Now, therefore, behold, thy wife, take her and go thy way. Take her. 
Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. <clears throat> all right, so I have in my notes, let's review. Let's review. <clears throat> we should review these things anyway. You know, this, this shouldn't be, you know, somebody says, you know, at my church, the teaching is like a river, and it just flows over us and everything. Okay, well, the water that's hitting you right then is going to keep flowing, and you're going to go, where did that go? You know, it's supposed to be more than just a river. It's, we're, you know, let us review. Lord, what are you saying? What do you want? I want to be with you. Sometimes I'm in the dark, Lord. Sometimes I have clarity. Ultimately, none of that changes my heart. I want to be with you. That's my stand. That's my life. That's the way I will be in the future, regardless of what comes. I don't worry about the future, Lord, because I want to be with you, and I believe you want your son out of me, and I want to give you that son. So... In Egypt, Abram appears to have messed up and lost everything, the land, his wife, and maybe his life. Imagine the confusion, fear, and sense of failure. I mean, you just, you just left the Ur of Chaldees. You, got, you, you, you sort of just like were on ice and slid through the land and ended up in Egypt, which is really not easy to get to if you look at a map. You got to go through a big, long desert. You talk about famine. <clears throat> and he, he heard from God, and God appeared to him and told him these things. Thy son shall be the heir. I will give the land unto him. And then... All this stuff happens. And all this happened in only a short span after getting the blessings from God. But in Egypt, he comes forth smelling like a rose with herds and gold and people. And none of it came as, notice this, none of these things came to him as the owner and master of Canaan, which was the land God had promised him. None of it came as that. So he can go, well, this is really good. Look, God's with me. But none of that came from the promises of what God said pertaining to the land. And he's going, look, I'm doing so well now. I mean, like 10 minutes ago, I thought I was going to die, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know. But here he is. You know, the Lord has blessed me. That's where we always go. That's where we always go. Well, the Lord has blessed me or the Lord just... And it doesn't seem to be listening or taking care of me. Why didn't God take care of me the way he takes care of so-and-so? Well, you just answered your own question. No son. <laughs> you're not giving him any son. You're, you're, you're demanding all of that for yourself and not getting out of the way and saying, Lord, I want your son to get this, and I don't want to take any credit for it. <clears throat> It seems as if he is more blessed in Egypt than in the place God said he would be blessed by him, right? All right. <clears throat> but God spoke to him about his son and that you're going to have it. And if your heart is for the son, then guess what? If God says you're going to have it, you're going to have it. Well, God's freely gives you his son. We take it as just salvation or the God who blesses from a far away. But God gives us his son. But we fear, that's what I was trying to, trying to point out earlier. We fear, we fear that and we fear it because we are not 
the sun and we're expecting what the sun deserves. We're acting like we're the air and we're not the air. And when we do that, God can't do what he wants to do. And then we say, why won't you do what you want to do? And he says, because you won't let me because you keep getting in the way. That would be like the father standing there and Jesus over here by the chalkboard. And then the father starts talking to Jesus. And every time he does, we stand in front of him, in front of Jesus and go, yeah, really? Is that for me? Oh, praise God, you know. And then we go, oh, you know, we kind of walk up going, praise God. And then he starts back talking to his son again. Oh, my God, more, you know. Just, I, I want every blessing in the book. You ever heard anybody say that? <laughs> well, tough, you can't have it. <clears throat> but, but those things do come to us because we are the the vessel, we are an earthen vessel that contains him because we are his body, because we are the temple of his habitation, because all the thing, because we are his branch of the life that flows. All the things that Jesus described was a description of him being in us. That was the relationships that when he walked the earth and he says, you know, I'm the true vine, you're the branch, and da-da-da-da, and, you know, you're going to be my body, and, and I'll be the life of the body, and, and you are the, the temple of God. We go, well, I'm the temple of God, you know, and we go, you know, my body is the temple of God. That's why I look so fit, <laughs> which I don't. But anyway, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, no, my body is the temple of God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're going, we're, we're going, my body is the temple of God, but I live in it instead of him. Oh, this is wonderful, you know? I mean, that's the way we look at it. I've heard so many people stand up and say, well, your body is a temple there, and you need to take care of it, you know? And it's like, yeah, by letting him live in there. How about that? Let's just start with who lives there. <laughs> you know, so, well, I'm, I'm going to drink some soy milk. <laughs> I mean, really? You know? And Jesus, who is, wants to live in us, isn't, and is up in heaven, go, oh, good, he drank soy milk. <laughs> this is so wonderful. I'm telling you, that he's taking care of my temple while he drives me out. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm not against soy milk. I, I don't drink Coke like I used to, thank God. See, I'm, this is healthy for me. But I think that the preoccupation with the body should be to make a place for the living Christ. I think that should be our preoccupation. We can do these other things. I don't want everybody, you know, worrying about your weight and stuff. Just let Jesus live in you, okay? <laughs> Could you do that? Just focus on that, and he'll take care of you. I know. I just heard somebody say, does that mean he'll cause me to lose weight? <laughs> no, he'll cause you to be a habitation of the living God. But maybe he'll come. <laughs> There's a possibility. I don't know. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> so, um, so maybe we are in need of redefining blessings from those things that make our lives easier to those things that please the heart of the Father by his Son. Is that good? Yeah. Redefine blessings. My God, folks. I mean, I, I, and I'm not putting down other churches or da-da-da-da, but I'm telling you that if all you ever hear is God wants to bless you, all God wants to do is, is make you fit, all God wants to do is do this and that, all that kind of stuff, then your focus is here on you. And the blessings then are what you would call blessings. You define those as 
Boy, I feel real comfortable today in my new lazy boy. <laughs> I feel so, so comfortable. This is the Lord, you know. I mean, I've always wondered, you know, we sit there and, you know, we're driving in our car and we go, this thing's shimmy and I can go pay $2,000 to get the shake out of your car and then you go spend another $2,000 and buy a lazy boy that vibrates. <laughs> it's like, just drive around for a while. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, do we, do we ever think through any of this stuff? <laughs> All right, so, no, those things are not in my notes. <laughs> Trust me, they're not. <laughs> they come from the dark recesses of my heart. <clears throat> okay, so for Abraham, being with the Lord and trusting in the work of the altars is where he must learn to live. Yes! Being with the Lord and trusting in the work of the altars, which is representative of the cross and which is representative of the pattern that which we've already seen. I mean, we, he's barely in the land and he's already made three altars. He, he goes here and he makes an altar and then he goes there and he makes an altar. He is in tune with a God of the altar. He's not just, in t he's not just walking around going, God, yes. I'm in tune with you wherever you are. He's in tune with the God of the altar. And we're, you know what? We're about to see that when we get into chapter 13. What happens to him once he leaves Egypt? Because he is in tune with the God of the altar. And he wants to stay there. So he will go back to that altar. You know that. Some of you already know that. Um, <clears throat> through those lenses, he should no longer merely view negative circumstances concerning that of being stuck in a crisis, but to see all things in light of the cross. In other words, um, okay, so Jesus says, I'm the vine, I'm the true vine. <clears throat> that means there's false vines. I'm the true vine, you are my branches. You are my branches. You're in me, not in some sort of doctrinal manner. I'm in Christ. You're in me so that my life can fill you, so that the things that I would call fruit can come out of you. That's, that's, what you, you, that's why you're in me. That's why I put you in me. <clears throat> and, uh, and the purpose of that is not to to bless the branch unless your definition of bless the branch is an increase of the life of the vine in you. Does that make sense? That would that'd be the blessing. Because, I mean, you don't see, like, you know, diamond necklaces and rings hanging off the branch, you know what I mean? I'm a blessed branch. <laughs> you know what I mean? All that kind of junk. You don't see that. That's not what, you know, and if you did, you'd go, that's weird. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, that's what God's doing when he looks at some Christians, you know, because that seems to be the, the big focus, you know. Well, this, is, this means the blessing of God. I have, I have four cars. I only have one kid. I have an extra in case I have a flat. I want you to just buy an extra tire. Anyway. <clears throat> Uh, you know, and, and it's all, you know, it's bigger is better and more. I got to have more, you know. <clears throat> well, can't we feel that for Jesus? I got to have more. Yes. You know, instead of being greedy, be hungry for life. Be hungry for, for the living God instead of the God far away, the, the one the Jews served, the God that was far away. But now we get to have the living God, and where does he live? In us. <clears throat> so the, the, the blessing is, number one, that he can fill us with his very nature and life. Okay. 
But there's also a blessing that if I'm plugged into him, I can move from being a twig to a big branch. Is that true or not? Yeah. Instead of, you know, you know, if you're a twig and you got life in you, then you have the life capacity that you need for that stage. Do you believe that? So we don't put down twigs, you know. You know, like, you're just a twig, you know. You're just a little old twig, man. Look at us. You know, <laughs> there we go, back to the, you know. Just, we don't do that. Because it's the same life. That would be to put down Jesus. But the advantage that the twig has is that it knows that God wants more of that life in me if I'm a twig. And so Jesus talks about the father is the husbandman. So the father comes up and goes, don't worry, little twig. I'm going to help you. And you go, <laughs> starts cutting. And he puts manure all around you and all this stuff. And you go, this, this stinks. Why are you cutting me back? I'm just a twig. <laughs> you know, just, we're so ridiculous. Just trust him. Be with him. Realize that he knows what he's doing. He's the, the husbandman or the farmer or the one who knows how to take care of the vine. And he is taking care of the vine. He's not going, he's not really relating to you as a little twig as much as he is. This is the vine. You know, and when he looks at it, that's, you know, you've seen a vine. It's all really one. You know, that, that'd be like, you know, me walking in the room and you go, uh, you know, they go, hey, here's Randy in his head. <laughs> Unless it was abnormally weird, <laughs> which it may be, but that's, not, that's another story. <clears throat> because, because it's one, and we're one with him. And so his goal is, and this is what he says, that, that the, the farmer, the husbandman, desires fruit. Okay, what is that? Because he's not just saying the husbandman desires um, more of the life in you. He didn't say that, but he works toward it, doesn't he, by pruning. He works toward getting more life in you by pruning. Okay, that's all John 15. You can check it out. But, but what it says that he wants is fruit. He pruned you, and that's going to get more life, but more life is going to bring forth fruit. You never see a little twig with a great big old grapefruit, you know, hang on, a watermelon or something. I don't know. But, you know, you don't see that. It ha there has to be a certain level of maturity before fruit can come, which means what? A certain level of maturity means that I need to be able to pray and and read my Bible, and no, that is not the maturity he's looking for. It's an increase of Christ. I, I've never seen a branch read a Bible. I'm not telling you not to read your Bibles, because you need to read your Bibles, okay? But I'm just saying, maturity for a, for a twig isn't going to be going, oh, man, I'm just going to read this thing until I pop out with fruit all over it. No, I'm going to I'm going to read this all right and I'm going to say Jesus is in this book and the spirit of God is going to open my eyes and he's going to bring forth an increase of Christ in me and that increase is going to bring forth fruit because it'll be the fruit of the life not of the branch. So more of Jesus less of me. Yes, yes, yes. But if you're just going to read this thing as some sort of a Pharisee or scholar, a scholar, and I've seen them before, they know everything. <laughs> they know the Bible better than me, you know. Not that I know the Bible that well, but I, you know, I do pretty good. <laughs> 
But they do. They, you know, I've had them just sit there and go, well, da 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 da, and this and that, and well, that scripture doesn't mean that, and this and that, and just going on and on, and you're going, okay, well. I mean, I remember when I was young, and the Holy Spirit showed me something which is still true today from where he showed me in the scripture. He showed me something, and, you know, I'm a Bible school student, and so I went to this guy who was, was one of the teachers in our Bible school, and he was a Bible scholar type person. And I was, so I said, look what I just saw in this, you know, that I shared. And he went, it, that don't mean that. It doesn't mean that. I'm going, but. The Holy Spirit said, it doesn't mean that. Well, what's it mean? Well, you know, when, when the Bible says, forsake all, deny yourself, and take up the cross, that means that you go home and you eat spinach. I don't remember what he said, but I'm trying to give you, you know, and I'm going, really? That's, and it wasn't even that scripture, but it, it's like, Really? That's what that means? He goes, yeah. And I said, okay, thanks. <laughs> I know, I need the Lord. I want the Lord. I want to know that I want to know him in such a manner that I don't just know the scriptures and can impress people with the scriptures. I want the very life of him to come out. And the life bear witness to people more than any teaching or any scripture quoting. And I'm glad you're with me on that because I got a lot of amens. In fact, I'm going to drink to that. It is Welch's, but I'm going to drink. What? That is not soy milk. Uh, which to Ramon would be I am milk. Some of you are pretty good there. Well, look at y'all. That was great. <laughs> I even tell them in Spanish. You know, like uh, Ramon Sakalavaki. You remember that one? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So. All right. We've we've got one paragraph left, and I, it's entitled "Similarities to the Exodus" because. Because we've, we've sort of talked about it, but there is this, this incredible template that God keeps using. He used it on the prodigal son. Then we went to the book of Exodus in the, in the, where they came out of Egypt. The template fit perfectly over that. And now we're with Abraham, and it fits perfectly over that. And we're going to see it. I mean, I don't know how long I'll be, you know, because you know, there's so much more beyond Abraham than we get to Isaac. And then... Jacob and and then on and on but um, there is a template and if we if if all we do is just hear scripture and we never we don't see in terms of templates God's heart it's templates of the heart of God and and when you begin to see the templates instead of just the well it's a story and you know well it's this and that you can see that you can lay that over the prodigal son. You can lay that over Exodus. You lay it over Abraham and go, whoa, there's a whole lot of the same things going on with the same result. The son comes forth. All right. So, you know, you'll say, you know, I can hear some of you thinking, well, how do I get them templates? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, here's, here's how you start. You go, Father, give me your templates, you know what I mean? <laughs> you start opening your heart to him because they're, they're his. They're not yours and they're not for sale, you know what I mean? And you can, and you, <laughs> and you can, someone can share them over and over and over and you won't get them until you see them. Yeah, does that make sense? You can't get these things until you see it. You can, the seeds can go in there. Someone can come along and water. But as I keep saying, God gives the increase. Not me, not anybody else. Okay? So, these verses in Genesis 12, 17 through 20 are similar to the events in the Exodus. The pharaohs of both these stories were stricken with plagues, right? Both of them. 
And the plagues were leading to what? What? Well, it, the, the plagues led to the exodus. No, that's, that's not the answer, but it did. Both of them did lead to that. They led to an exodus out of Egypt, but the main thing it led to was what? The altars? It does definitely lead to an altar. And you're on the road for the sun now to bring forth the sun. You see that? Egypt, when they came out of Egypt, the firstborn, you might remember those guys? Well, that was representing Christ, the firstborn. And I was, I was thinking, I think it was last night, I was just looking over some scriptures and it was in John 10 and Jesus said, um, I give my life for the sheep. And I flashed, you know, Matthew 26, whatever it is there, where, the, where he's sitting before them as the Lamb of God slain. And, and he divides the nations. He divides them not into people groups or languages. He divides them into sheep or goats. <clears throat> and in the, in the real sense... He gave his life, he gave his life, he didn't just die, he gave his life for the sheep. I give my life for the sheep. He gave his life. And they became sheep and lambs. And the goats didn't. And you sort of see that in the Exodus. Remember this now? The firstborn, the, the, the lamb that was slain in Egypt was for the firstborn, not for all Israel. Do you remember that? It was for the firstborn so that he could give his life to them, for them, to them, and they would come out to the Father and they would sacrifice in that same spirit of the lamb that they ate. <clears throat> so, uh, the plagues continued until Pharaoh lets his firstborn son go. Even though he's not even birthed yet, he is there in the heart of God. He's there. He's always there. And remember, it was famine that also required Jacob to send his sons down to, into Egypt for the provision in the first place. And this is a lot of similarities or this is either an accident or a template <laughs> these sons became the children of Israel for whom God sent Moses to bring deliverance from Pharaoh and Egypt in the case here in Genesis it appears God used a plague it appears God used a plague but for Israel the it was the lamb that brought them out. The lamb was the tenth plague, but it wasn't a plague. It wasn't a mistreatment. It was instead of them dying or hurting or scratching or, or whatever uh, because of the plagues, the Egyptians doing that, instead of them doing that, the lamb died. Complete reversal of the way people operate. So... Here in this case, God uses a plague, but in Genesis, I mean in Exodus, he used a lamb that brought them out. So in Abraham's story, where is the lamb? That's what we should always look for, folks. Where is the lamb? We need to find the lamb of this story because they're coming out. Right? Okay. So... In Abraham's story, where is the lamb? Is it Sarah? Was it? Nope. Or was it Abram? Mm, not so much. Look at that guy. He's trying to protect his own life and everything. 
But instead of being ready to lay down his life, Abram feared and resisted death, verse 12. So this is the last sentence of my sharing tonight. Maybe again it was God who laid down his right for Abraham to be with him and delivered him anyway. Maybe it was God again laying down his right to have the seed come forth when we should be bringing it forth. And when we don't, then he just has to deliver us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are we are on a journey. We are not just being Christian. We are on a pursuit that will end up with eternal realities flourishing instead of living a temporal life. And so we ask you, because we, we ask this knowing that it is already in your heart, not to we're not asking you to put it in your heart, but it's in your heart. We ask you to aim that toward us, where that Christ will come forth out of us and it'll be pleasing to you. We, we want the lamb in us instead of you always having to lay down your life again and again just to deliver us because we're messed up. And you are faithful to do that. It's the way that you are and we love you for it and we thank you for it, but we're tired of it being about us and our mistakes, we want it to be about you and your son. So, Father, we, we cry out, we call out unto you. We say we don't even know where to start or how to do this or that or to fix anything. We don't. And in most of our attempts, we literally put ourselves further away because it's us again. So we say, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know, but we want to know you. We don't want to know the answer to this dilemma. We want to know you, and we want to know the one that you want known in us. We say, let it come by grace, but Father, let it come out of the desire of your heart for that son, Jesus. Let it just, it is grace to us, but for you, you're not just giving grace. You are releasing forth the sun more and more in these twigs that we are so that you can see the fruit of his life in us instead of the fruit of our life. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being good father to your son thank you and we thank you for the, this reality before we even see it not because we deserve it but because you are determined so we thank you in Jesus name amen amen there are a couple of